Hey guys, it's me, Tim Melvin, coming to you from down here in South Florida this time. It's been a long time since we've done one of these just kind of short, freeform videos, just kind of talking with the camera. And I apologize for that. And of course, a couple other things that we're going to try to start back up here. We're going to get back into some podcast conversations with Garrett Baldwin and myself, bring in some guests, and get back in the habit of doing these short, quick little videos just to talk to everybody. Now, Banking on Profits continues to work exactly as we had hoped it would work when we started this project. We're outperforming the broader market. In the last three years, we counted them up. We've had 29 portfolio takeovers. It's much more than that over the entire, well, now almost six years of existence of Banking on Profits. Um, the community bank stock investor, you know, delivering solid returns. Uh, we've had some fun with some guest articles, and I've got a new one coming up for you this month. So we're going to continue right along with that. But in addition to that, I do a lot of research into making money in the stock market from the perspective of an individual investor. I don't run hundreds of billions of dollars, not even tens of billions. I'd settle for a billion. But no, there's a lot of things we can do, folks, when we're not managing enormous amounts of money. We can do things that larger investors simply cannot do. And, you know, Charlie Munger was asked a couple years ago at, uh, I believe, the Daily Journal meeting, you know, how to beat the market. And he said, you know, if I had a lot of money today, I don't think I could beat the market starting out as an investor. He said, but people that can crawl around in kind of the inefficient corners of the markets and do the things that nobody else is doing, they should be able to outperform easily. Now, we've done that with Banking on Profits and the Community Bank Stock Investor. We've delivered solid results uh, with very low volatility and very pleased with the way that product has worked. If I've made a mistake there, it's that I've been maybe a little too cautious and held a little little too much cash that actually helps me sleep better at night and the rules for buying a new portfolio entry into banking on profit are quite strict we're not going to break them we're not going to start that habit now or ever the rules work we'll stick with them that means cash piles up hey cash piles up i can wait for a bear market because fortunes are born in bad markets and in the meantime we just own the banks that qualify limit our buying activity to those that are on the buy list and watch the profits rack up but now there's other things that individual investors should also be doing and as far as I can tell so far, I'm willing to have something disproved. Um, and by the way, if you're happy with what you're doing and you love your returns, just ignore me. Um, but if you're not happy with your returns, then you should know there's four basic things that individuals should do with their money. And they're really the only four things that individuals should do with their money with very limited exceptions. One is own small banks. I don't know any reasonably wealthy okay i'm not talking gajillionaire billionaire status but your local millionaires in and around your towns ask them what they own they've got a stake in at least one of the local banks it's been my experience for 30 years now and i'm pretty sure that's still true so what else do rich people do to get rich well they own real estate Okay, well, you own your house, but that's not really – unless you're planning to downsize completely and live in a condo that costs a whole lot more – less, a whole lot less, I'm sorry, at some point in your future, that's not really an investment. And even if you're planning on moving to a condo at the beach when you sell your house – condo at the beach is probably going to cost eh, about what you sell your house for. So don't think we can really look at that as an investment per se. However, commercial real estate has made more millionaires than anything else in the United States, and we can own tons of it through the real estate investment trust market. Most people don't don't own enough REITs. I don't understand it. Uh, I know that that's the big asset allocation mix from Wall Street, 5 to 10% in real estate investment trusts. That's insane. If I could find enough to put 50, 60% of my money into attractively priced real estate investment trust, I would do that because I know that going back to 72 when the tax laws changed, REITs have crushed the overall stock market. Now, I'm talking about equity REITs in this perspective, okay? Those that actually own the properties themselves have outperformed the S&P 500 over an extended period of time. And with the exception of the uh, O. Oh, 
08, 09 credit crisis in a normal run-of-the-mill bad market reach to a lot better than the, than the stock market indexes. So real estate investment trusts, buying them at low multiples of the asset value and of the cash flow produced by the underlying uh, properties is a winning strategy, and it should be part of every individual investor's portfolio. The other thing is um, actually sounds boring. When you talk to people, It's this is actually – Maybe even more boring than buying small bank stocks at a discount to book value. Um, That's buying closed-end funds at a heavy discount from the net asset value of the fund. I love this strategy. There's activists like Boaz Weinstein and uh, Philip Goldstein at Bulldog Investors that are in this space. So much like we follow guys like uh, Lawrence Seidemann and Joseph Stilwell into small bank stocks, we can follow activists right in to a lot of these discounted closed-end funds and profit from their activities to widen or to narrow the discount back closer to net asset value. It's a winning strategy. You can be super selective. Uh, you can focus on tax-free uh, municipal funds if that's what you're into. You can invest in global infrastructure, which is one of my absolute favorite areas to invest in from a long-term perspective. Um, so heavily discounted closed-end funds should absolutely be a part of your day-to-day investment strategy. Well, take that back. You should have no day-to-day investment strategy. You should have a long-term investment strategy. Closed-end funds should absolutely be a part of that. And finally, private equity replication should be a part of your portfolio. Now, what private equity has done to become the best performing asset class doesn't really have as much to do with their alleged expertise and you know business smarts as they'd like us to believe. Most of the long-term returns, it turns out, have come from bu- buying smaller companies that have debt on the balance sheet. Well, they put debt on it when they do the buyout, actually. And then the process of paying down the debt is what makes the return so high. Very easy here, folks. We can go out and find companies that are small cap comp in nature that have debt to equity ratios higher than normal. This goes against everything they ever told you as a value investor. But you're looking for companies with a debt to equity average over one, okay, that ratio uh, higher than other small cap companies. But you're looking for companies that pass a strong credit test. We use um, a nine-point checklist that is the Piotrowski F score, and then we use something very similar to the Altman Z score model to find the companies that qualify for the portfolio. Then to make it into the portfolio of private equity replication, well, they actually have to be paying down the debt quarter by quarter and year over year. When you own a portfolio of those companies and you monitor them closely for credit quality, it crushes the overall stock market. Once again, they tend to be smaller companies. We're going to pay very low multiples for these companies because that is the key to the success of the private equity industry, Uh, which, by the way, should be very worrisome to private equity investors right now when the current average multiple is uh, over 11, the highest, in fact, since before the credit crisis. We're not going to pay that much. We're going to pay somewhere down around 7 to 8 Uh, with an EBIT multiple earnings before interest and taxes. And research shows that that actually crushes the overall stock market with actually right about the same volatility. Now, here's the thing about using these four key strategies, okay? And I think you should have a little bit of money probably in all of these. If you're in the accumulation phase of your lifetime, then I think you want to be heavier into private equity replication and small banks. Uh, You're basically running a big buyout fund at that point with a little bit of money in real estate and uh, some in closed end funds. If you're in the distribution or income taking stage of your life, well, then you're going to want to tip the portfolio a little bit more towards income producing REITs and the much higher yields available from the closed end bond fund. But still, you should own some community banks and you should still um, have some money in private equity replication. If you're just the normal growth and in income, I got 25 years to retirement, you should probably run an equally weighted bucket of all four strategies with your serious cash. Everybody's got play money. We'll talk about that another day. But with your serious, this is how I'm going to retire at the beach. This is the pot of money that's going to make my dreams come true. Those four strategies should be your key focus. There's no high-frequency trading 
in the four markets that I just outlined, there's not a lot of institutional money in there, period, pushing stock prices around. The ETFs are not active buyers, uh, with the exception of in the REIT market, um, and we just tend to avoid those that are heavily owned by ETFs, but um, not real active in most of those markets, so we don't feel the influence from their buying or selling much at all. The key thing about this strategy, you've got four high-performing strategies all of which have a low correlation to each other and to the stock market. So everything's zigging and zagging, smoothing out overall returns. We've done a lot of research on this. I don't think that you should do anything but those four strategies. We've got the small bank strategy in place. We're experimenting with the best ways of delivering um, the other three to you on a regular basis. We'll get back to you on that. Um, no sales pitch or anything today. I'm just letting you know what we're up to, what we've been up to uh, for the last, uh, guys, it's probably been eight or nine months since we've done one of these videos. So anyway, baseball season's over. We're waiting to see what the Orioles are going to do. Uh, we're down to college football now, and that's okay because the teams I follow are Navy, Notre Dame, and Florida. They're all having great years. Next week, Navy actually plays Notre Dame. Always a fantastic football game as the midshipmen will show up and be ready to play against Notre Dame on Saturday. So I'm really actually looking forward to that that game. I always talk about books. If you don't like books, this is where you should stop the video. But two of the standout books that I've read uh, since we did the last video I just want to talk about. Socialism Sucks by two professors, Lawson and Powell are their names. Well, these guys, they like uh, to study economics and they like to drink beer. So they went around the world and just drank beer in all these socialist hotspots. Venezuela, Cuba, everywhere you're thinking of. They went to Norway and uh, the other Nordic markets but what they found, those are not socialist countries. They're very aggressively capitalist countries with high income tax structures. That's a discussion for another day. The socialist places that they went, Cuba, Venezuela, a couple others, the book is just a fascinating, fun read because these guys have fun with the topic, made the point. Socialism doesn't work. Capitalism's not perfect, but it tends to be a little bit better. One other book on that particular topic is Capitalism, an American Love Story, by uh, Ken Langone, the founder of Home Depot. That's a great book. Not only should you read it, but if you got any late teens, early 20s walking around, they should read it as well. And then I just finished this week. It just came out last week, so I went dove right into it. The Man Who Solved the Market by Gregory Zuckerman. This book is about James Simons of Renaissance Technology and his medallion fund, which has returned 66% a year since 1988 top performing hedge fund of all time. Now you can't replicate what this guy does. Okay. He's got, he's a mathematician. He hires rocket scientists and other mathematicians with ridiculously advanced degrees. They have super computing power. They make lots and lots of trades uh, pretty much every day. Although it's worth mentioning that when you look at these really successful quants, like Mr. Simons, uh, like Two Sigma Partners, they all have, as part of their overall approach, at least one core deep value strategy that looks a lot like what we do with the community bank uh, uh, banking on profits and, of course, uh, private equity replication strategies. You're going to run across the same names in our screening results, our portfolios, and their portfolios because they know it works long term. The bulk of the money is in what I call stat arb trading. You and I can't do it. We could never make enough trades quickly enough to compete with these guys. So I guess we'll just have to stick with what we're doing on a regular basis. Um, but it is a fascinating read, and it's it's worth reading because as you're reading, I want you to think that every time you make a trade, you're probably trading against James Simons or someone just like him. So if you're trying to trade short-term day-to-day and you're going to compete with this guy, you're going to lose, okay, most of the time. He even says in the book at one point, we're not taking any money away from long-term investors. Uh, we're taking money away from those who trade too much and make mistakes. Don't be that guy. Take the longer-term approach, just like we've taught you with banking on profits, and we're going to be coming up with these new and interesting and exciting ideas in the weeks and months ahead, getting those out there to you. And if you're interested, you know, I hope you try them and uh, uh, give us a test drive. In the meantime, 
banking on profits, community bank stock investor, new issues out every week and every month, respectively. We continue to beat the market. We're having a lot of fun with it. If you're not signed up for one of those two, please go to MarketFi.com and become a member today. Otherwise, guys, I'm going to start, uh, once again, trying to do these as often as possible. So once a week or so, we'll get you another video out, another topic of some sort. Not always about banking, guys. I um, love small bank stocks, but there's other things that we might want to talk about along the way. Anyway, I'm Tim Melvin. I hope you enjoyed the little video, and we'll talk again soon.